following is a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. For more information, please visit our website at www.dallasgenealogy.org. Today we have Bill Covington. Uh, Bill is a public school teacher by profession, having spent 28 years in the classroom where he's taught social studies and English as a second language. He's taught in Dallas ISD as well as Waxahachie ISD. Currently, he is an instructor of dual credit U.S. history, world history, and government and economics at Waxahachie Global High School in Waxahachie, Texas. He is also an adjunct instructor of Western Civilization, U.S. history, Texas history, and world history at Navarro College, also located in Waxahachie, Texas. He is married to June Renee Jacobson Covington, and they both reside in Cedar Hill, Texas. They have three grown children and two grandchildren. And Bill was also the TXDAR state winner of the 2017 Outstanding Teacher of U.S. History Award. Thank you, Bill. I just want to make sure that I don't get connection to that. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Um, I uh, uh, met Lisa down at the uh, Waco McLennan County Library lock-in, genealogy lock-in. It's always the third Friday evening in October. And uh, she asked about me coming and speaking to, uh, to the Dallas Genealogical Society. And ladies and gentlemen, I must say to my own shame, uh, I am 58 years old and this is the third time in my life that I've actually been inside this building. And uh, the, the, the first time I was an ESL teacher over here in Oak Cliff and I brought a group of ESL students here and they interacted with the librarians. Uh, the second time was the deadly one because my wife came for an art show that was up on the fourth floor and I had always heard about the eighth floor genealogy section. And, and I, uh, I went up there and, uh, and she had to basically come up there with a, uh, uh, well, with some kind of heavy object, po possibly her purse, and drive me out of the stacks. So, and, and this of course is the, the first time that, that I, the third time I've been here, but I'm, I'm very honored to speak to the, uh, to the genealogy society, uh, uh, or the genealogical society. Uh, of, of Dallas, and, um, uh, and I had honestly forgotten what Lisa and I had agreed that I was going to speak about, and when she told me today, well, we want you to speak on African Americans, uh, that is one of my favorite subjects, and I don't get a lot of opportunities to speak on them, so please feel free, Lisa, if I go way too long, just, you know, just, just give me a cut off. Um, when, uh, uh, now, one thing I do not know, and, and, and again, this is to my shame, I am not sure even approximately how many Native or how many African Americans were here in the South, or in the, in the colonies at the time of the outbreak of the American Revolution. I do know that all 13 of the colonies at least recognized the institution of slavery. Um, the first one that actually forbid slavery to to exist within their borders was uh, Vermont. And when they wrote their state constitution, they actually were a republic, the same way that Texas was a republic. They actually were a republic for 14 years. We were a, were a republic for almost 10. Um, of course, they had this fire and, and brimstone leader, uh, um, Ethan Allen, and, and his brothers. Uh, but they, it was written into their constitution that slavery was forbid within uh, the borders of Vermont. And actually, at that time, it was not known as Vermont. It was known as the New Hampshire Grants because it was being fought over between New Hampshire uh, to the east and New York uh, to the west, and then Massachusetts to the south also had uh, input. Now, but of course, once again, the Allens had a different idea as to what was going to happen, and they declared themselves to be a republic in 1777 during the midst of the American Revolution, and it was a republic until 1791 when it became the 14th state uh, to, uh, to join, uh, join the Union. Um, all the states recognized it, but there were ones that had already forbid, uh, forbid uh, uh, slave sales within their borders, mostly New England colonies. Uh, the Quakers having a, uh, 
uh, a strong presence in Pennsylvania, had uh, had uh, already they had they had gathered together their meeting houses had actually gathered together in a type of Congress to discuss whether or not they wanted to continue to practice slavery themselves. The vote was no, we do not want to. And so they began to divest themselves. Uh, they began to free, to manumit their slaves, or, or uh, I guess in certain instances to sell them to others. But they, they were not practicing slavery at the time of the outbreak of the American Revolution. Even in the South, where they were practicing slavery, there were still free African Americans. And one thing I want to emphasize today, ladies and gentlemen, um, these were not just simply people who got up in the morning when the bell woke them up on their plantations and went to work in the fields and worked there all day long or worked in the big house. And then when the bell would sound in the evening, they would go back home. They were not, and that's what I want to emphasize, they were not a passive community. These were very active contributors uh, to the, uh, um, well, to the vitality uh, of what was going on here, uh, here in the colonies. Um, just very briefly, uh, for uh, just to give you an idea of the type of, of activities that went on with them, they had they had um, more passive ways of resisting. Uh, the, if they were on a plantation in the South, um, they could just simply play sick and not work on a particular day, which meant their labor was lost uh, in the fields or in the big house on that one day. Um, they uh, could break tools. They could leave uh, animal uh, structures, animal pens, places where livestock was supposed to be uh, uh, pinned up. They could leave a gate open and they would get out and then they would have to spend most of the day out looking for them and bringing them back. Um, they could, uh, there were many, many ways in which they could just simply choose to resist what was going on. One favorite way that I found out about a few years ago that I think is really kind of fascinating, they could run away without actually leaving the plantation. They knew where there were good hiding places, if the, especially if the plantation was large enough, if it had a wild area or a swamp area out somewhere, they would run out to these places and they would do what was called lay up. And they would just simply spend other slaves back in the, uh, uh, in the quarters knew they were out there and at night someone would, would usually slip out and bring them food. And then they would bring them a message about what was going on back at the big house uh, or back on the plantation and then the slave could also pass a message through them. What would end up happening is eventually this slave who was out hiding out knew that the overseer was under pressure from the owner to get this slave back to work. And so, and of course, the, the, the overseer had no idea where this guy was, but he knew who his best friend was. And so he would go to his best friend and he would say, you know, if I had an opportunity to, to talk to John, this is what I would say to him. And I would say, please come back to work um, and, uh, uh, because we, we really need you here. Well, the next night, or the nightfall, that slave would probably slip out, he would go out to John, and he would communicate this to him. Well, John would give, would say, okay, well, go back and tell the overseer, I don't want to be punished, and, and I, there's a few other things I want too. Well, the next day, that slave might say, go to the overseer and say, you know, if I was John, um, I wouldn't want to be punished, you know, if I came back and I would want these, and they, were, they would negotiate through this intermediary and then someday, someday, just suddenly in the morning when they rang the bell, John would be there and, and he would go back to work. This happened a lot. And, uh, and of course, the slave rebellions that, that we think of too, those ones, they were in pretty desperate straits when they felt that they needed to actively rebel against, uh, against whites because they knew it was a desperate, desperate act. The slave rebellions, as far as I'm aware of, never actually succeeded uh, long term here in, uh, in, in, uh, in America. But there are, are many individuals whose names we know that uh, were, 
uh, very active, again, in, in some facet of the American Revolution. Uh, one of the first individuals killed uh, was a man named Crispus Attucks, and he was actually a leader of the Sons of Liberty in Boston. When, on, on the night of uh, March 5th, 1770, when the British uh, troops guarding the Customs House uh, fired on a crowd, what became known as the Boston Massacre, Crispus Attucks was one of the first ones killed. And, and he was African-American. Um, there's a man named James Fortin, F-O-R-T-O-N, who actually lived in Philadelphia, a free African-American. Uh, Crispus Attucks was also a free African-American. He was a sailor uh, by, uh, by profession. But John Fortin had been a sailor, but then had started his own business that was related to maritime activities, and he became a sail maker. And so, uh, in Philadelphia is probably the mo most cosmopolitan city uh, in America at this point in time. Um, it was not only the capital of, of um, uh, Pennsylvania, but it was also seen as being the, colon the, the, the colonial capital of all 13. Of the co That's where the Second Continental Congress met. Um, it's where uh, most of their their governmental work was done out of until it was captured in 1777, but then the British abandoned it in 1778 and moved back uh, to New York City, where they would remain for the course of the, uh, the American Revolution. Uh, but Philadelphia is, is a, ships are constantly coming and going from, uh, from Philadelphia, and uh, I guess I need to move this down so that I don't get all that that feedback. Um, Philadelphia uh, remained a very vital place for the maritime activities all along the eastern seaboard. And of course, James Fortin was there as, as with his own sailmaking business. He had people working for him. And uh, he even continued his efforts after the American Revolution. Um, the, when the revolution broke out, the British, particularly uh, Governor Dunmore, in Virginia uh, realized that the way the British could initially cripple the American war effort was to extend uh, freedom to enslaved individuals who fled their, their enslavement or fled, fled their working opportunities and came over to the British side. Uh, Lord Dunmore formed what was known as the Ethiopian Regiment and that's exactly what he did. He, he broadcast to, uh, to the enslaved individuals in, um, uh, in Virginia, if you depart your service with the Americans and come over to us, we will, you will become British soldiers. And then afterwards, um, uh, after we suppress this rebellion, um, you, you will be free men here in this, uh, uh, in, this, this, uh, in this colony. Of course, they didn't suppress the rebellion and uh, many of these African Americans would choose to, at the end of the war, they would either migrate to Canada, they might migrate down to uh, some of the islands of the Caribbean, like Jamaica and Bermuda, or they would actually migrate back to England. But either way it goes, these areas picked up uh, significant uh, African American populations at the end of the American Revolution, and many African American individuals today in Canada, in the Caribbean, and over in um, in England can trace their ancestry back to someone who fought as a loyalist, an African-American loyalist on the side of the British. But many of these, many of them felt like, no, I, uh, I'm an American and I, 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 I have, have lived, my family's lived in this land uh, for, for a certain period of time and I'm going to fight for uh, the Patriot cause. Uh, one, one thing, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, let me back up a moment. We actually know when the first African Americans came to British North America. Was Spanish, they were here a long, long time before this um, as free men. Uh, when Cabeza de Vaca was shipwrecked down along the coast of Texas in 1542, I think, uh, he and one other individual on board the ship survived because, and the reason why I say that is actually about 30 of them survived, but they all washed ashore 
Now, they came ashore in the area of, the, of uh, territory that was controlled by the Karankwa tribe, and the Karankwas ate everybody who came on shore. And so, but uh, um, Cabeza de Vaca kind of convinced him that he was a, a medicine man amongst the, uh, amongst the Spanish, and uh, there was an African-American individual, a Moorish individual, who was with him named Estevanico, and these two guys both convinced the Karankwa that were medicine men, and so they spared those two. And they were uh, more or less kind of uh, enslaved by the Karankwa for about the next seven years. But then at, at the end of that time, the Karankwa showed their, their gratitude to these two individuals by releasing them. And as I understand it, ladies and gentlemen, they walked uh, westward to basically the area of San Antonio and turned south and walked south. Their, their goal was Mexico City. Now, if you know anything about the geography of Mexico, Mexico City is way, way down south. I mean, in, in relations to where the Rio Grande is, it's way south. And, uh, but they just simply walked until they found a, a Spanish settlement and, uh, and, and at that point came back into, uh, uh, came back into um, uh, Spanish society. Cabeza de Vaca wrote a book uh, called uh, Explorations and Journeys in the Unknown Interior of Nuevo España, and it's still, his, his diary is still, is still in, in publication today. Estevanico went on to become an explorer in his own right. Uh, explored a lot of New Mexico, southern Colorado, and Arizona, uh, and eventually settled up in in um, uh, in those areas. I do not know how how, how he ended his life, but uh, he settled somewhere uh, in what is today the American Southwest. Um, so we do know, though, when the first African Americans came into I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that was a misstep. When the first Africans came into uh, uh, British British North America. Um, on a Dutch ship in 1619 uh, the, in, in the, the, in, into Jamestown. Uh, the Dutch were, uh, their settlement was New Amsterdam, which we know today is New York, and uh, they were along the Hudson River, and uh, their merchant sea captains also had, uh, they not only had a merchant sea captain hat, they also had a pirate captain's hat, and whenever Dutch merchant ships were always armed and because they realized we don't really have a Dutch Navy that can travel around the world with us. Uh, these are very aggressive businessmen who are opening up ports all over the world. Uh, they, they're just sailing into ports and opening up trade with them. And, uh, but they didn't, they didn't mind uh, attacking, especially Spanish ships at times, uh, and they had just captured a Spanish galleon off of, because any ship that is out of sight of land is at the mercy of a smaller, is at the mercy of a, a faster, better gunned ship. And so this is the golden age of piracy. And uh, a uh, Dutch ship had just attacked a Spanish galleon just off of Florida, had captured it, had basically looted the ship, killed the entire crew, burned the ship to the waterline, and they were now running north for New Amsterdam. But they realized if the Spanish catch us with all this loot on board the ship, they're going to be able to identify it as belonging to one of their ships, and they'll kill all of us for being pirates. So they just thought to themselves, hey, <laughs> let's dump it on the English. And so they sailed up the James River and unloaded all of these goods, all of these hot, ex, recently ex-Spanish goods onto the English in Jamestown. And amongst the, the goods they unloaded on them were 13 Africans. That's the first introduction of Africans into British North America, uh, 1619 at Jamestown. We do not know what happened to those original 13. The English may well have set them free uh, to just simply uh, go their own way or to remain there in the community. They may well have made them indentured servants, which meant that they worked for uh, for a, uh, a master for a certain amount of time. Usually it was five to seven years, but then at the end of that time, contractually, they had to be released from their, their obligations. Or they might have enslaved them. We're not sure exactly what happened. We do know, though, that by 40 years after that, there were slave codes on the Virginia law books uh, that basically said what a slave could and could not do. But um, 
again, uh, coming up to the, the time of the American uh, Revolution. Uh, even, again, even in the South, there's many, many African Americans that are free. There are actually African Americans who own African slaves. They are plantation owners in their own rights, and they own African slaves. Uh, and, and honestly, even places like South Carolina and Georgia, you're, you're having those types of free individuals. Um, I, I do a, uh, I have a blog uh, where I'm looking at the crew of a particular ship that served in the Patriot cause during the, uh, during the American Revolution. And um, it's the frigate South Carolina. It, was, it served the, the state of South Carolina. Uh, we know for sure there were at least six African Americans, some of which were free on board that ship. There's some of them that are probably slaves because one of them's an individual just simply named South Carolina. Another one's named uh, Dublin, after the city Dublin, Ireland, Dublin, Guion, and Guion is the name of the captain of the ship. But the rest of them, are, are probably free men. And uh, we know that at least, or I, I believe at least one of them survived the American Revolution because his name turns up in the 1800 census in, um, uh, in South Carolina as a free farmer out in one of the Western, uh, the Western districts that, was, that had been recently formed. Um, but this, uh, this, this blog that, that I've been doing, I'm, fi I'm finding out so much about, just simply about the entire crew of the ship, but in particular about, about African Americans who served during the American Revolution. Many of the individuals in South Carolina were ship's pilots. These were freemen. They were not slaves. They're, they're, they're ship's pilots. Um, as I tell my students at school, I used to always think that what would happen is uh, when a ship wanted to leave port, it just simply left port. You know, they, I tell them they got in the driver's seat, they took the park brake off, and they took off. And then they pulled into wherever they were going, they came in, you know, screeching halt in the water, put the park brake back on and got out of the ship. I said, that's not the way it happens, guys. Each port city has got its, each channel leading into a port city has got its own intricacies. It's got its own set of mud flats or sandbars, underwater uh, obstructions, the wrecks of previous ships who have wrecked on these objects, you know, and sank, and that ship's pilots will guide ships out of the harbor and, and bring them in, and, and in the same way they would bring them in. They probably spent a lot of time just simply sitting down at the mouth of the harbor looking to see if a sail would appear and then they would get in a rowboat, they would row out to the ship and they would bring it in. Many of these individuals, particularly in the, in the inlets, the, the bays and whatnot of, of South Carolina, these individuals are very, very important. I know the name of one of them for sure, a man by the name of Thomas Jeremiah. And uh, uh, again, a freeman uh, and uh, the, these guys realized they had a skill. They, they knew how to do something that others didn't know. And so they used their, their position of importance within colonial society to basically affect their own, uh, they were freemen, but not just simply, they, they dictated their own, their own circumstances, their own willingness to work, and to work for one side or the other. Uh, they, uh, for instance, some of them, some of the, uh, these individuals, in, in reading about the biography of, of Thomas Jeremiah, um, many of these individuals would only work for the Patriots. If, if a British ship came, then they just simply, if the, when the British invaded South Carolina, actually captured uh, Charleston in May of 1781, a lot of them just simply absented themselves from the dock fronts. They, they, they just simply left Charleston and they went down to other towns or they would simply hide out in the bays and inlets so that they couldn't be found by the British. But other ones would only work for the British and they would work bringing their boats in and out of, of, the, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina Harbor. Um, America was a great place for smugglers. 
And uh, uh, the British had established a set of what were known as the navigation laws that basically said what Americans could and couldn't do. They were trying to convince us, they were trying to convince the colonists to trade only with them, to not trade with each other. So if, a, uh, if uh, there had been a good indigo harvest in South Carolina and they knew there was a market for it, uh, it up in New York, what had to happen was the ship that was loaded with that indigo had to travel to London, England. It had to clear through the customs that were there in London, England's port city, and then it could sail back to New York. And so th this is when a lot of our founding fathers and John Hancock is right there. Uh, I mean, pro he made his fortune off of smuggling. Uh, these guys would just simply load their goods in small coasting vessels that were fast. They would wait for nightfall and they would run as far up the coast as they could. And when the sun was coming up, they would put into a bay or an inlet. They would, they would haul their masts down and try to hide their ship during the day. And when nightfall came, they would, everything would go right back up. They'd pull out and run further up the coast. And uh, again, many of, of these sea captains would have been these ship's pilots who knew how to pilot these small vessels. They knew the ins and outs of these inlets and these, these small bays. And they, uh, uh, so they're, they're participating right there with the, the economy, albeit illegal economy, uh, of their, their individual uh, colonies. Um, one, uh, I, I've, uh, uh, I, again, am fascinated with the, the services of African Americans during, uh, during the American Revolution. And, and honestly, ladies and gentlemen, I've been able to collect about 35 to 40 books just simply on African Americans during, uh, during the American Revolution. And uh, one of them, I noticed, is called Black Courage, <laughs> which was, is the, the title that, I don't think I can, I think you must have given it that name, Lisa. I didn't give it. But um, one of them is called Black Courage, 1775 to 17, uh, 1783. Another one is called From Slaves to Soldiers. And it's about the first Massachusetts, the, I'm sorry, the first Rhode Island Regiment of Foot, a, 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 a unit that served uh, during the American uh, Revolution. Um, they are, of course, they're from Rhode Island. Uh, over 75% of the personnel of that regiment were African Americans. And uh, they were stationed, it, Rhode Island only ra raised two regiments during the course of the American Revolution. Each of the colonies was given a, an amount of, of, of regiments that they were supposed to raise. Uh, Virginia and Massachusetts were the two most populous, and so they were each given 15 regiments apiece. And I think New York had five, and North Carolina had 10, and, and it, it, it worked on down to Little Delaware. They had one that it was supposed to raise, but uh, Rhode Island had to raise two, and so they just numbered them the first and second uh, Rhode Island regiments of foot. Uh, the first Rhode Island regiment of foot was the one that was overwhelmingly African American in its, its personnel. And when the British invaded Newport, Rhode Island in 1777, I believe it was, they were, uh, they were uh, in, intent on driving uh, the colonists out of Rhode Island because then they were going to use Rhode Island as a base to send ships north and south to interdict American shipping that was uh, coming into and coming out of uh, colonial ports. Um, the American army was under a general, Nathaniel Green, who would win most of his uh, fame in the South, uh, fighting against Lord Cornwallis. But he began to retreat from Rhode Island, and he gave the 1st Rhode, Rhode Island Regiment the uh, task, the entire regiment, the task of forming the rear guard uh, of the army as they were withdrawing from, uh, from Rhode Island. Um, Th this regiment, uh, you know, we hear about fighting retreats. Uh, well, this regiment fought. It didn't retreat, it fought. And the British actually charged the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, I think it was four times. The Rhode Islanders beat off these attacks the four times, and when they finally left the field, when they finally began to withdraw following uh, the American army, uh, they left 50% 
uh, of their combat strength on the field. In other words, 50% of, of their, their, their personnel had been killed or had been wounded. And, um, uh, and what I've heard from modern historians is they consider a, the, the U.S. Army today or the U.S. military today would consider a regiment to be combat ineffective once they've lost 10 to 15% of, of their, their combat strength, and yet the Rhode Islanders lost half of their combat strength before they finally withdrew. Um, many African Americans, uh, there would be numerous regiments that would be formed under the British as, as loyalists, and um, they would use these, uh, these guys had an extremely large area of operations because something I've just recently found out, the British invaded Nicaragua during uh, the uh, during in 1777 they invaded Nicaragua to uh, there were Spanish bases down there that they they wanted to uh, eliminate and many of the the loyalist troops that were with them when they invaded were African Americans and of course then the Spanish would reinvade in 1779 to try to uh, eliminate the British uh, being down there but those ro those African American loyalist regiments were still there and fought back Against, uh, against the Spanish uh, invasion. The Spanish also had lots of African American troops. They'd already abolished slavery in, uh, in Mexico and in Central America. And so they had many Afri free African Americans, in particular in San Antonio. There were many skilled individuals, carpenters, uh, brick masons, gunsmiths, who act because they f these individuals fled from uh, plantations in Georgia and uh, South Carolina, and they basically worked their way westward. And when they when they initially entered, a lot of them would head south because Spain was. Uh, no, I'm sorry. They would continue. Spain had been Spanish territory by the outbreak of the American Revolution. It was British territory. If they ran to Florida, they would normally seek asylum amongst the British. But they, they knew they would have a better deal if they uh, sought asylum amongst the Spanish. And so they would head uh, westward and, uh, and, and uh, entered uh, Spanish uh, society down there and became very, uh, uh, again, skilled individuals who were seen as vital members of the, the society in San Antonio. Um, the, I'm sorry, the re one of the uh, reason why I brought up this, this frigate South Carolina, uh, at least two or three of the individuals on board this ship uh, married into the free African American community that was in Charleston, South Carolina at the end of the war. There's two brothers, one named Richard and Gilbert Wall. And they both married into the free African American community down there because these individuals were immigrants. They were from Ireland. And it was seen as socially acceptable for an immigrant to marry into the free African American community. And so uh, Richard Wall, in particular, I, I've, I've found a lot of information on him. He married a young woman who was a member of the free African American community. And they raised two sons. Um, and I cannot recall their names at the moment, but they raised two sons who became very prominent members in the pre-Civil War economic activity that was going on in, uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. And Gilbert Wall also married into, his older brother married into the, uh, the African American community also, but I can't find any information on, uh, on him. Um, the, uh, um, even even out even out out west and by west actually it's America's first west um, Kentucky and Tennessee uh, there are the, yeah that's that's that was the first wild west was just beyond the Appalachian Mountains the British had established what was known as the Proclamation Line of 1763 which basically forbade anyone who was not a licensed Indian merchant from going west of that line. And they, they gave uh, the sheriffs of the communities just on the east side of the line the duty of occasionally going over onto the west side of the line 
and trying to find people who were squatting on Indian territory. They basically would, would tell the family, get out of the house, head east until you get to this certain creek, which is back on the east side of the mountains. You can set up your, your home back there, and they would burn all the buildings. Uh, um, as a matter of fact, this happened in particular, and this has got nothing to do with African Americans. This happened in particular to the, to the Gertie family. And it's believed that's one of the reasons why Simon Gertie became such a fanatical loyalist guerrilla fighter against the Patriots was because of his home being burned when he was, uh, when he was a, young, a young boy. He fostered a hatred towards, uh, uh, towards the, the, the Patriots. Um, but uh, Daniel Boone, had, uh, he, he, owned, he owned some slaves. And when he went, probably our greatest frontiersman of the 1700s, he was a lawbreaker. <laughs> he, when they set Boonesboro up before it was actually legal for there to be settlement on the west side of the Appalachian Mountains. And um, the interesting thing is, uh, in the West, it was fairly typical if a family owned a slave that the slave was buried with the family. And if the slave d died, that he was buried with the family. And so um, at one point, uh, Rebecca Boone, as I understand it, I, I, I don't know a whole lot about the Boone family, but as I understand it, Rebecca predeceased uh, Daniel Boone, and, um, and she was buried. And Boone had instructions that she was supposed, he, when he died, and he died, I think, when he was 88, uh, that he was supposed to be buried beside her. But when he died, he was actually over in Missouri Territory. He, he, had, he had left the United States, moved across the Mississippi into what was Spanish territory, he had more or less become an alcalde, a Spanish, uh, or no, an ayuntamiento, uh, a, a Spanish uh, judicial official over there. When he died, he was buried over there in Missouri. And eventually, I think it was in 1910, Kentucky told Missouri, we want our, uh, we want our, you know, we want we want the father of our state back, you know, and so, so they uh, and 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 now some of you ladies and gentlemen might be able to contest this, but I've always wondered, you know, by that point there's nothing left uh, of of his. I've heard that what they do is they take a a, a device that looks like a T, that's got a screw on one end and it's a hollow tube, a core and they will drill down into the ground and they will pull the pipe back up, they will pop it open and they will examine the core sample that it drew. And if they find a little thin layer of rotten wood followed by immediately by a little thin layer of white and then another thin layer of rotten wood that lets them know that there's a burial there in that place. And so I'm sure that's what they did for, they just simply went and checked and found this, this okay, this is, must be the, the, the grave of one of them, you know, and then they moved over a few feet and did the core again and said, okay, this is both of them. But I have heard, now, this may just be in Texas, all that is necessary for a grave to be quote, in quote, moved is once you've figured out there's a burial there, one shovel full of dirt, and then the grave is considered to have been moved. Now I do a, I do a a, a a colonial presentation every October down in uh, El, Elmwood Cemetery, Oakwood Oakwood Cemetery down in, in Waco. It's the oldest cemetery in Waco, and I stand next to the grave of Neil McLennan and, and all of his families there with him, and uh, uh, and. I talk about this, this individual who was born during the American Revolution, ultimately immigrated over to the, uh, to the United, to, uh, immigrated to North Carolina, then immigrated to Texas, and had McLennan County named after him. And, uh, but I asked the, the, the director, of, I said, why is his grave so far back in the cemetery? Why is it not up buried? And they said, well, they moved the graves in the 1950s when they were building Lake Waco. And, and I said, okay, well, what I've heard, and I just told him what I've told you all, he said, oh, well, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you anything about that. And I thought, yeah, I bet you can. <laughs> so, it's, yeah, so, so I tell people out there, I said, I think that the, their mortal remains are actually under the west side of Lake Waco, you know, and so, but, um, 
But when they when they moved Daniel and they moved his grave to the to the courthouse, no, I'm sorry, not the court, the Capitol grounds in Frankfort, Kentucky, uh, and and buried them there. But Missouri still says, well, you got you got Rebecca, but you didn't get Daniel, because the way our records say it, the one that was on the side that you took the shovel full, that was where, where a very, very dear slave was buried. So you got Rebecca and one of the slaves, but you didn't get Daniel. We still got Daniel. And so, but I, I think that they just don't, they don't make a big deal about that from, you know, anymore. Um, there is an individual in, in, in the same way that Daniel Boone is associated with, uh, uh, with Kentucky, there's a German individual by the name of Casper Mansker who is associated with Tennessee. And he effectively founded the first settlement in the Nashville area, and uh, it was called uh, Mansker Station. And he had a, once again, a very dear family slave. And at one point, Casper and his slave were out hunting, and they got ambushed by the Cherokee. And the slave was wounded, and, and Casper, uh, I think there, there might have been one or, or two other white individuals with him. They ran, and they, they left the slave behind. And they're probably sorry they did that, because just a couple months later, um, this slave is leading Cherokee assaults on other white communities. That happened a lot, too, because many of these, these African Americans uh, if they escaped from, again, a, a plantation in Georgia, North or South Carolina, they knew where the Indian frontier was. And they would go out and, and, and uh, uh, basically mix in, marry into uh, these Native American communities and effectively become Native Americans themselves. Daniel Boone, in particular, in Kentucky, had trouble with one of them. There's a man by the name of Pompey, and uh, an African American who had mixed in with the Shawnee and was a very, very skilled, very well-known Shawnee war leader. And uh, he uh, is, was present at the main assault on Boonesboro in 1778 and um, uh, led the Shawnee contingent. Because uh, now it, it, he, knows, he knows how the whites think, and he also knows how the Shawnee think. And usually Native Americans would get really bored with sieges after a while because they weren't they weren't burning cabins down and taking prisoners and scalping and whatnot like that. So if, if, if the, the society, if the community had been warned uh, with enough time to all get into the main, uh, the main fort, they could usually hold out against, um, against the, uh, uh, against the, they could just wait long enough that the Indians would get bored and they would, they would leave. But Pompey knew, that's the reason why the, the African-American leaders of these attacks were so, uh, were so dangerous, because they knew how the Native Americans thought. They also knew what the white strategy was, and they could normally convince their guys to stick around just simply because the Native Americans would say, this guy knows how the whites think, so we need to listen, we need to listen to him. And, and again, that was with Pompey there in Kentucky, as well as with this other individual. And I cannot remember his name that was down, Casper Mansker's slave that was down there in Tennessee. Um, and and the, uh, just as kind of a, uh, uh, an anecdote, the, uh, uh, I, I uh, heard about a uh, Chickasaw and a Creek uh, it warrior who met them met each other out in the woods, and they were both about to fire at each other. But then they realized the other one was a Native American, uh, like them, and so they uh, they began to talk with each other. And the Creek said to the Chickasaw, "You know, um, I, I I didn't I didn't recognize that you were a Chickasaw. I thought you were a white man." because so many whites had mixed in with Chickasaw society. And the Chickasaw guy said, that's okay, to the creek, I thought you were black. You know, and because so many African Americans had mixed in with creek society. And, and, and it's the same thing's true with the Seminoles down in Florida. Um, uh, well after the American Revolution, the Second Seminole War will be the only war in American history that was specifically over the issue of escaped 
uh, escaped uh, enslaved individuals because so many of them were running away from plantations in Georgia and in Alabama at that point and heading south into Florida and mixing in with the Seminoles that the, uh, the U.S. basically went down into Florida looking to, to, to gain these individuals. It was a fairly inconclusive war because the Seminoles just withdrew further south into the Everglades. And as I understand it, there's a portion of the Seminole tribe that never left, that was never removed under uh, Andrew Jackson and sent to, uh, uh, sent to uh, Oklahoma. There's still a portion of them that live way down in the Everglades. And again, many of their members being, uh, being uh, descendants of, of escaped African Americans. Um, George Washington had, uh, had a, a, a favorite slave named, uh, named Billy. And um, uh, Thomas Jefferson actually said that, uh, somebody asked him once, who are the two best horsemen in, in Virginia? And he said, he said, without hesitation, he said, George Washington is the best horseman in Virginia, but Billy Lee is the second best horseman in Virginia. Because Billy Lee, when Washington went off to serve as the commander in chief, uh, during the, uh, the American Revolution, Billy Lee went with him. And Washington was, uh, he was our commander in chief for eight years. In those eight years, he only crossed the threshold at Mount Vernon one time. So he was only home once. And the army, as I understand it, the army was passing near to Mount Vernon and he spent a day or two there at home and then rejoined the army. Billy Lee was with him the entire time. And, um, Towards the end of his life, he was, he was a slave owner. Um, as a matter of fact, ladies and gentlemen, uh, his wife, Martha Custis Washington, was at the time that she married George Washington, she was probably the richest woman in the state of Virginia. And, and yet, she probably, all, whenever, a woman, whenever a woman married, all of her property devolved onto her husband and effectively became his. Now, if he died, it all devolved back onto her. And that's probably the reason why she was so rich, was because her previous marriage uh, to Mr. Custis had ended in his death. And so all of his property became hers. But she knew when she said yes to George Washington, all of her property was going to become Washington's. She must have seen something in the sky that was six foot five, you know, that this is a man who's going places. And so I probably should hook my cart up to his. But, um, Eventually, as, as, uh, as Washington, uh, as when he was in his second term uh, as president, the one from 1792 to 1796, he began to have moral concerns about, about owning, owning slaves. And so in 1795, the way I understand it, he manumitted all of them, and that included Billy Lee. But I believe Billy Lee remained as a servant and worked with him until he died in 1799, and then and then went uh, went his own uh, went his own way. But um, a a African Americans, uh, their their I find their history fascinating in the American Revolution because once again this was not a passive community, this was a very active one that had as much input into what was going on in the colonies as as uh, as as the whites did. And, and in the same way, too, uh, the Hispanic community had a lot of input into the American Revolution. I've actually got a presentation entitled Texas's Role in the American Revolution. Um, and, the, and even Native Americans. There were Native Americans who chose to fight with the Patriots instead of going with the British, which the vast majority of them did go with the British. Uh, do you, ladies and gentlemen, have any questions you wanted to ask? I realize I haven't spoken anything I haven't mentioned any of this over here. Oh, this is adult show and tell, okay? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remain after the meeting, so if you all want to come down and pick anything up, open up anything. The, the, the most frequently heard comment from older gentlemen when they pick the musket up is, my gosh, this weighs more than my M1 did during basic training. And so I actually looked it up, and it's true, an M1 weighs about eight and a half pounds, and the musket weighs 10 and a half. And so, and there were there are records of boys as young as 12 carrying those muskets in the ranks and fighting in the ranks in the same way that there's there's indications that sometime men in their 70s 
we're also out fighting. Okay, ma'am, you, and then I'll get you, sir. And, and what little uh, research I've done of my own genealogy pre-American Revolutionary, I noticed that when they came, they first looked for indentured servants. Yes. Before they did, before mm -hmm. they bought regular slaves. Mm -hmm. Is that because the indentured were, were easier? There, there was a steady stream of them coming from the old world. Uh, people, um, uh, and this is the way that, I, that I, I teach my students, so I'm sorry if this sounds a lot like a lecture. <laughs> um, they were poor people over in Europe who realized I'm never going to make it anywhere in the society, but if I go over to the colonies, I can, I can have a chance of, uh, so they would go to a shipping company and they would sign an indenture with that shipping company where they would pledge to work for whoever bought their indenture over there, they would pledge to work for them for five years, five to seven years, no pay, uh, given, given whatever hand-me-down clothing they, they, they were given, they would agree to sleep, they had to, they had to be taken care of, they had to be fed, they had to be given a decent place to sleep, but then they just basically work for free. At the end of that seven years, they would be set free. Um, and they're just as poor as they were back over in, in Europe, except they're over on this side of the Atlantic now. And they know that just possibly a short distance away is the frontier, and that they could go out there uh, the way they would, the, the way their claims worked is they would go out, they would stake out normally 10 acres, uh, maybe 20. They would have to clear at least three of those acres. They would have to plant and harvest three successive crops, and they would have to build a shelter for themselves. And if they, if they lived there for five years, they could then go into the courthouse and say, this, I, I've worked this for five years. You can send a surveyor out there. You can send a sheriff to check, every, check out my story. It is now my land. Yeah, it, it was definitely a cheaper, it was definitely a cheaper prospect. But the problem is that's the frontier and there's people out there who, and this is what I tell my students, there's people out there who wear war feathers and war paint on their faces and they don't like white people coming onto their property. And so, yeah, it, there was always, the you took the risk of, of, of being killed by, by a, a war party out there. And so, but people were willing to take that. <laughs> They were willing to take that risk. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, <clears throat> in research about family. They're all from Mississippi, ended up in Mississippi mm -hmm. in uh, Wilson County. But there's a pattern they all follow. They were brought from, uh, in one case, North Carolina to Tennessee by the stewards. You may have heard the stewards in Tennessee and then Mississippi. Another one was South Carolina into Alabama to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Those are very typical migration yeah, routes. Yeah, I'm yeah. a, a pattern for yeah. all the branches of my family. Uh, so I have two questions. One is, what's the best documentation for finding that path? Is it compiled somewhere uh, in North Carolina or in South Carolina or in Virginia? That's the first question. Okay. Yeah, documentation for that pattern of, of, of uh, like you said earlier. They, they, yeah, they, they, yeah. They're, they're ex, um, uh, they fought in the war, they got the land grants, they're moving into the past the Appalachian, one stop, and then going into Mississippi. So, um, I just, my, my pet, my, my family's was almost exactly the same way, sir. Uh, Virginia to South Carolina to, to uh, Mississippi, Texas, ultimately out to the gold rushes and the California gold fields, but, um, a lot of times individuals, and, and you, you're, want, you're, you're talking about wanting to trace your own family's uh, route. Um, uh, and, and once again. The route I can trace, what I'm looking for is documents for. Okay, the, yeah. The that was brought along that route. Okay, the, there are probably individuals here who can give you, because uh, I'm, I'm a very, very amateur <laughs> genealogist. There's probably others here who can give you uh, more precise but I do know this, every, uh, and, and I know this happened in my family, an individual would actually write an inventory of everything he owned. And literally it was everything. They would put bent nails down on that, they would put rusty spoons, they would put broken horse harnesses, they would put everything they owned. And frequently within that, that manifest, 
uh, of, of everything they owned, which ultimately they would come up with the value that that individual was worth. Um, they, would, they would normally list any enslaved individuals down on those, those inventories. Unfortunately, they usually just list them by first name. And, and this, is where I got the, this is where I got the idea that, that slavery was not a cheap prospect. It was an expensive endeavor because um, they normally listed the slave's name, uh, their gender, their age, maybe their height, um, but then they would normally list any skill they had out to the side. And the first two individuals that are listed on, I don't know, my great, grand, great, great, however many times grandfather's inventory, one of them said carpenter and another one said bricklayer. And each of those individuals sold for over $1,000 each. They, were, they had a price value that was placed on them. Whereas field hands, they were usually $300, $400, $500. Women were always worth more because they had the ability to give birth. And they were always worth more. Young women were always worth, worth more. But that's the only document I can think of, sir, that, that you could actually look for are these inventories. If you knew who owned them, look for one of their inventories. And then it, you could make a connection between, okay, the individual was listed on the inventory back when they were in South Carolina. It's listed in Mississippi. And, and uh, but, okay, that's your first question, sir. What's the second one? No, I want the same question. I have those documents once they get you know, further in the Mississippi. I don't have those documents back in. Right. That's yeah. what I'm looking for. Those documents back in uh, seem to disappear, written that way. But yeah. the second question was uh, one of the families goes back to North Carolina, and the, his the story of the history is that one was the father was African American or African. Mm -hmm. the, the mother was white because he was, the, the son was a free person of color. And his yes, son, yeah. His children were slaves because he was not a female. But talk about, uh, especially North Carolina, that intermarriage between Africans at that time and white. Yeah, okay, the, it, it happened a lot. There, there were especially, um, when you're out, more towards the frontier, you know, getting out, out there because uh, there, there's a lot of intermarriage. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of intermarriage with, Afri with, uh, with uh, Native Americans, African Americans. You get far enough west, there's an intermarriage between the folks, because Kentucky was actually, the entire state of Kentucky as we understand it today was a western county of Virginia, the whole state. And, um, and yet you get in Western Kentucky, individuals are marrying Spanish individuals across the Mississippi River because they were trading with, uh, they were trading across the river into Missouri. And so there, yeah, the frontiers are a really dynamic, dynamic area. And so um, again, I, I, I can't, th I, I don't know any specific I instances, but African American individuals, would, there were lots of free uh, men and women of color on, on in the in the colonial South, and and again the uh, the instance of this one individual, this Lieutenant Richard Wall, who was an Irish immigrant, had been on board this one ship, the frigate South Carolina, and he married into the free African American community that was there in Charleston. That's the one that I know of for sure, but uh, yeah, there's I, I also know too that my uh, my ancestor who lived in South Carolina at the time of the American Revolution. He was a lieutenant. Uh, he fought at the siege of Augusta, Georgia in May of 1780. And um, he had the same inventory where he listed, you know, uh, all the goods he had as well as all the slaves that and he owned, I think, five or six. But um, there's a woman down there that he lists just simply as, as you know, so-and-so, she's a skilled seamstress and whatnot. But in his, in his will, in the will that he actually writes just a few years later, he said, at my death, she and her son, Edward, are to, now, he had never mentioned Edward before. She and her son, Edward, are to be taken to any free state of their choice and be manumitted. And that's all that's said. And so 
I'm thinking to myself, Edward may have been my however many times great-grandfather's biological son by, by this woman, and that he didn't, want, he didn't want this woman that he had feelings for and his son continuing in, in slavery. And so he said, at, the, at my death, they are to be taken to any free state of their choice and, and set free. So I, it, and again, this is just a, it's just postulating on my part, but, because uh, I don't know what, he didn't say that for any of his other slaves. They were all given to sons, daughters, his wife, if, if he died before she died, but he set that one and her son free. So I'm sure it happened a lot, and, and, um, uh, and, and again, especially in the communities that are out more towards the frontier, just simply because there's not, there's not the laws and the strictures as there are back along the, the extreme East Coast. So I, I don't know if I answered your question at all. <laughs> um, any, any, other, any other questions? And once again, uh, I'll stay afterwards and, uh, and leave this here. So and be sure to answer any questions that you all have. But thank you so much for allowing me to <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Dallas Genealogical Society. If you're already a member, thank you. Your membership dues are supporting this and other society activities. If you're not yet a member, I hope you consider joining. You can become a member for as little as $35 a year, and you can join by going to our website, dallasgenealogy.org, and clicking on the Membership tab.